Hello and welcome to the CEO Magazine for yet another one of our absolutely fantastic, mind-blowing, deeply insightful and inspirational conversation. Why is that? Because you will get to hear Anthony Wido, whose perspective on how to grow your business and lead teams will force you to rethink what you're doing and how you're doing it. Anthony is the boss you always wanted to have. He's a true leader, an entrepreneur and a turnaround CEO who currently is the chief executive of Ovation Brands with 18,000 employees a company that he revived from bankruptcy that once had 1.7 billion in sales and is now growing again. Unless you're a vegetarian, chances are that you've had a meal at one of their restaurants. Anthony has turned around many companies and has also started them from scratch and made them big. When you get the chance, I recommend his episode on the highly regarded CBS series, The Undercover Boss. It is highly impactful. In our conversation, Anthony brought into focus the most elemental principles in business that are either overlooked or are often forgotten and he reminds us of them with intense energy as he shares his life experiences. We're really thankful that we got to speak with him and I'm very happy to share this wonderful experience with you today. So friends, here's Anthony Vito. It's great to have you on the show. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Wonderful. So. You know, you have a, a background uh, that's rather rare to find, you know, corporate background, entrepreneurial background, uh, mergers and acquisitions, consulting, everything combined into one and at the highest levels. I mean, you know, amongst the brands, you've got some really well-known brands under your belt. Uh, so I wanted to really get into certain issues that, you know, the, not the platitudes, not the prosaic statements, but, you know, something more substantial, get into the details of uh, how you came about to be that successful and what did you learn on the way, especially given that your beginning has been rather humble? Yeah, I know. Absolutely right, uh, Nick. I mean, it, it, you know, uh, my beginnings are humble uh, from a very small town in central Pennsylvania, uh, you know, not, not from any, any money of any kind, uh, really heavy duty working class family uh, that embraced work uh, in a very frankly entrepreneurial family who had their own business. And, and I grew up in that. So my, my fundamental foundational principles come from that, uh, about how I lead people, how I behave, uh, integrity. Uh, frankly, honestly, Nick, I, I have uh, 12 leadership commandments that have come out of that, uh, of that uh, frankly, those beginnings and have, and have been refined since then. But how do you lead people? What's, what really are the responsibilities of a leader? And, and so I, I credit everything to my, my, my family, my parents. This is, this is very interesting because uh, so many people uh, start uh, businesses and, you know, bulk of them, most of them end up either failing or not really succeeding. Most businesses don't. It's very rare to find successful serial entrepreneurs. I mean, you started uh, the Mid-Atlantic with zero from scratch and within three years took it to $250 million in, in revenue. And that's, people can't even handle a single restaurant. <laughs> You know, so coming from zero to 160 restaurants in three years, th there's something special about it. And that's not the stuff you learn in the business school, right? Uh, yeah, it's not. I mean, I mean, business school is terrific, by the way. And I have a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, respect and, and, and certainly uh, admiration for, uh, for business schools. I think they do teach a lot of fundamentally good management skills. I think the only the area the business schools are, 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 are lacking today and trying to, to, uh, to add to their curriculum is leadership. The difference between management and leading. And I think that's fundamentally, you know, sort of one of the foundational principles in my, in my career uh, is how to lead people, how to, how to handle many, many tasks simultaneously. Uh, multitasking is talked about by everyone, but frankly, not mastered by very many. And, and I think that's, that's another, that's another uh, uh, fundamental thing that my father taught me uh, because he was always doing five things at once being an owner of a business responsible for all elements of the business. Uh, and so I grew up learning how to do five things at the same time. And so, uh, you know, fundamentally multitasking, fundamentally uh, leading people uh, in, a, in the proper way. In other words, in causing them to desire to follow you as opposed to demanding that they follow you. Uh, those fundamental principles are embodied in my 12 leadership commandments, but um, you know, those are all fundamentally things I learned as a child growing up at age nine, 10 years old, working in the kitchen of my family's restaurant, washing dishes. And that's where I started. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that, I think that I've been very blessed to have the opportunities 
like I did with Mid Atlantic to take that from scratch to 200 plus million in revenue. Uh, it was wonderful to have the opportunity, but to your earlier point, how do you capture that opportunity? What do you do to make sure you're successful? Um, you don't sleep a lot. Uh, you're prepared to, to work, and that's another one of the other fundamental principles that my dad taught me is work ethic. Work ethic. Um, you may not be you know, smarter than everyone in the room, uh, uh, but you certainly can outwork everyone in the room. That's something that you can choose to do. And yes. that's something he's always told, he always told me that stuck with me, frankly, to, to this point. So it's something I use today. I mean, I work at my business today seven days a week. I do. Yeah. And, and you know, I still have balance. I still I love my family and have, have balance. But I work at my business seven days a week. I'm willing to pay prices to get somewhere and to get my business to a certain spot. Right. So, I mean, you have to do what you have to do and you have to recognize that if it requires more effort, then it, it needs to get the effort. That's exactly right, uh, Nick. That's exactly a great point because you have to be willing to do whatever it takes as a leader right. to get the results, obviously within the framework of, of, of legality and those things. But, but, but my point is you have to be prepared to pay the price. Today, many people aren't prepared to pay the price. They want the outcome, but they're not prepared to pay the price. Now, here's, here's my something. Life, my life's been about paying prices. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you, know, you can't have uh, a desirable goal that you want and not willing to pay the price, that's simply not possible. You know, you've got to have the true will to get it and then you figure out a way to get it. And that's you can't exactly. replicate yourself. It's not easy to replicate yourself. It doesn't matter how uh, high up in an organization you are and you think you will find other partners or employees or, or trusted executive team. Right. But you still can't replicate yourself. You, you can't and you have to lead by example every day. And, and what I fundamentally believe is that, uh, you know, you, you can tell people, uh, uh, you know what to do but if they don't know your hearts in it and that you care deeply by your demonstration of your of your behaviors right, right. they won't follow you they'll tell you they're gonna follow you and they'll follow you maybe in part right but true commitment from a team comes from somebody that has a passion which 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 is a really critical one of my commandments is about is about the magical blend of the head and the heart Right. In business school, we're taught about pretty much 99% of business school is about training your brain. Right. It's right. not about training your heart. Yeah, I, I call it conceptual uh, learning versus experiential learning. You know, yes. business is not uh, like mathematics. It's not conceptual. It's got to be experiential. You've got to go on the dance floor and dance. You yes. Know? You can't learn by reading. You can't learn by telling. You know, so many business books talk about communicating the vision within an organization. How do you communicate? Not by emails or or these big posters, but the fundamental start is from being the vehicle of communication, so to speak, right? That's, That's what right. you're saying. That's a great point. And, and it's exactly what, I, what I'm saying. So if I go and demonstrate through my personal passion that I really care about an outcome, what I've experienced in my life is the vast majority of people will follow me. Right. But if I go and intellectually explain to them why it's important, I'll get a percentage of the group. But if my heart and my brain become united and my heart and my brain are saying the same thing and communicating non-verbally and verbally the same things, then I can get almost 100% compliance in terms of people following. And you know, this, this, you mentioned about learning in your childhood. If we really think about it, uh, you know, from your family perspective, you learn this lesson with your kids. Yes. They will not do what you tell them to do, but they will do what you do. That's exactly right. That's exactly, that's, that's a great point. And, and leading, leading is fundamentally a lot like raising children. It is, certainly, certainly it is. Uh, and I agree with that. I mean, I try to demonstrate to my sons when I see them, uh, you know, demonstrate my behaviors and hopefully that, that, that some of that sticks. Uh, you know, there's moments where I have the dad talks as well, right? right? And just like when you're leading an organization, there's moments when you have the talk with your right. team. Now, Anthony, what about, um, what about, talent versus skills. In other words, you know, from what I hear from you is that you learned a lot from your father, uh, from your childhood, which is great. You learned a lot from the business school as well. But like you mentioned that it's the self-management because leadership starts with self-management. You know, you lead people by managing yourself correctly. So that self-management, is that a talent or is it something we acquire? Are we scripted incorrectly when those who be the people who fail more often 
did, did their childhood or their learning experiences, were they wrong? Can they relearn? What's your theory on that? You know, mental discipline, uh, I think, is in essence the sort of the, the category you're talking about, personal mental discipline. Um, that, to me, is uh, not a learned trait. Uh, in other words, you, you know, you, 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 know you, you have to have some inherent desire to be able to translate that to your activities every day. Uh, now, can you, can you refine that trait? Yes, you can. But fundamentally, you have to have the DNA in your body about being mentally disciplined about activities. And that, that is something that some people have that trait and some people don't have that trait. Uh, and, and I know I, I sort of was blessed by my, by my DNA to be born with a trait to be very disciplined and laser focused. Now, believe me, I'm a lot better at it today than I was 10 years ago. Uh, so I have refined it. But I don't, I don't fundamentally think you can create it from scratch if you don't have it. Right. I mean, if you just don't have the talent, then you can. But a lot of people who fail, uh, fail either because they don't have the trait itself or right. they actually haven't uh, evolved. I mean, sometimes people don't have the know-how. Uh, there's a lot of material out there uh, where people read about these theories. I mean, HBR is full of all these theories, right? But it doesn't necessarily translate into action. So, <clears throat> Yes. So there's need for talent. There's, so in, in a sense, I define it as act how and know how. So you can yeah. read the know how, but it doesn't translate into act how. Yeah, yeah. So is it I think it's a great point. Have that capability, or is it that they're just confused? I mean, you've met a lot. People, you know, look, I don't think. I, I think certainly, certainly, I think there's two buckets, right? I think some people don't have the capability, uh, which is which is okay. There's still other things, many other things they can be successful at besides leading people, right? right? But but I think I think there I think there are people that have the fundamental raw talent that have not been able to access the, ex, the experience, the, the experience that you were talking about earlier, required to refine that talent. So they haven't been seen the models, they haven't seen the examples, they haven't been blessed to have, you know, mentors in their life that have demonstrated to them certain things. So it's, it's sort of hard to tell when the, a young person's coming up through the ranks, whether they actually don't have the DNA or the DNA is just covered up. Right. And it's not, it's not been developed yet. Uh, and by the way, I have a 16 year old son and I'm trying to figure that out with him right now. I'm trying to figure out whether he has the DNA or doesn't have the DNA. And, and that, that's, that's one of the closest learning experiences one can have. I have a 13 year old daughter who is uh, testing uh, all my capabilities right now. <laughs> yeah, I get you on that completely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, in, in terms of uh, your experience, when you build these teams, I mean, three years, uh, 160 restaurants, that's about, again, people acquiring the right talent and developing it as well. So yeah. what's your philosophy on acquisition versus development? Yeah. So, so look, I think there's, um, you, you know, uh, initially when you start something from scratch, like I've done, uh, unfortunately, you're not blessed with the ability to promote from within because there is no within. There's right. nobody there, right? So you have to properly seed the field with all these folks from the outside. Uh, when I when I founded Mid Atlantic, I, I had you know eight years previously been at PepsiCo. I had a lot of relationships there that I relied on to pull people into my enterprise right. that I was confident that were properly you know with the proper competencies to match the jobs that I needed. So I was able to sort of, you know, prime the pump, if you will. Right. Now, once you have all those people on board, then you have to create a mission and a vision for that new set of people to rally around. Mm -hmm. And then there's further refinement to that, right, of whether those people fit the jobs or not. But that's what I basically did. I brought in all these new senior leaders, then I brought in the layers below them, and then we recrafted our mission, which was to grow all these restaurants in a short period of time. Um, and then I put, that's where the, found, the foundational elements of my 12 leadership commandments came to, came to play, right? And the biggest one, frankly, is, Nick, that if, if you are able, if one is able to put the needs of the enterprise and the mission ahead of one's own needs, hmm. everything seems to come together. If you can do that one fundamental thing. Hmm. If you're unable to put the needs of, of others ahead of your own, then it's very difficult to, 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 to glue a team together. You just can't become, a, you're not a good teammate at that point because you're so individually focused. Now, what does that specifically mean to say putting the enterprise in front of you? Because you, know, you, you have an understanding of that statement much, much deeper than what you could tell to your son because he'll say, yeah, I understand. I, I, I hear you. I can repeat the sentence. 
Yes. But truth is, I, I really don't understand that. Yes. Yeah, so when I say about, okay, so what do you think about when you wake up? Do you think about, gee, what am I going to do? You know, what do I need today? Where am I going to go today? What, what do I need today to make, make me happy? If those are your first, you know, two hours of, of thoughts, then, you, then you're not thinking about others first, okay? Right? So first of all, get a mission that you can be passionate about because the worst thing that can happen is having somebody not passionate about the mission that they're on. Right. We're sort of there just going to grind it away and they have no desire to really be there. They're just there for the paycheck. Right. So be passionate about your mission. Then align everybody with that mission and then make everybody else understand that the needs of that mission come ahead of their own personal desires. Now, now two things you've said, which, which kind of come together, the discipline and the needs of the mission. Here, yes. Here is something that happens with some people. You get so entangled with your belief, your emotions into the mission that you actually think you're about the mission, but you end, uh, end up uh, thwarting the mission itself by your personal egocentric involvement in, in it. And you really don't see what's good for the organization or the original mission. Uh, yeah. Is that something you have dealt with yourself or with others? Nick, I've dealt with it. <laughs> I see it. I see it today in my organization, right? Um, and, and that's my job as the leader of the enterprise is to keep people aligned. And, and one of the things that I think a leaders need to do more often that they don't do is honest, direct, and thoughtful feedback. That's the mechanism that you use to realign people to say, I know you think you're doing this which is best for the enterprise, but in, a, in reality, that's not working for the enterprise. That's actually best for you. Right. What's best for the enterprise is this. So that's the job of leaders, is to continue to nudge and put people on the path, uh, excuse me, keep people on the path that frankly want to be on the path. They're motivated to be on the path. They're passionate about it. They want to win. They want to be in the enterprise, but people stray from the path. Right, it's, it's human nature, it's not human easy. nature. And but my job as a leader is just to keep reminding people who are straying, you know, very directly, you know, what the mission is, again, to repeat, and, to, and here's the behaviors that, that you're using that aren't helpful, right. and here's the new behaviors I'd like you to use, right. right, that are helpful and get you back on the mission. So yes, it's a constant, uh, it's, a, it's very dynamic, uh, it's like a living, breathing organism, and yes, people tend to stray. Uh, but I will tell you, self-importance is the number one enemy to leadership. Hmm. Yes. Self-importance is the number one enemy to leadership. Courage is the number one problem with, in my humble opinion, with leaders in America today. They're all lacking courage. To do the right thing for the greater good of the enterprise, the community, the country, the state, whatever they're running, they lack the courage to tell people what the, what the best course of action is for that enterprise that they're running, or that entity that they're running. Instead, they default to saying yes to everything and telling people what they want to hear. Yeah. It's in America today, honestly. It is. And we have that culture of uh, grandiosity, uh, self-aggrandization, where you just want to be the biggest hero out there. And the company becomes less important oftentimes than, than the CEO. That's, that's exactly right. And, and that can be very hurtful. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. So um, I was shifting onto something else. So you were, you know, you might want to conclude that. Yeah, no, I just, I, I couldn't agree with you more completely. I think you're abso absolutely right. And, and so what happens is people get distracted and their, their personal needs sort of become dominant. And, and then they, and they understand, then they don't understand, frankly, why they get frustrated, uh, you know, in their role. In my company, you know, uh, we are on a mission. And I think about the 18,000 people's jobs that I'm responsible for every single day that I wake up. I think about 18,000 people that I'm responsible for making sure they receive paychecks every week. And what that does to their, for their families, they can pay rent, they can pay car payments, and everybody in my enterprise knows where I stand. They all know where I stand, and I cause them to come with me on that mission. Or frankly, if that's a mission you can't embrace and be passionate about, then, then, then you don't belong in the enterprise. And the, and the most important thing here is you have to get out of your own self. You have to be driven by a cause, a purpose. That's, that's right. when you will be succeeding. Otherwise, that's right. your heart can go all over the place. You got to bring the heart and the mind, as you said, 
uh, close together. You can't be, because the heart will tell you your purpose, but at the same time, your mind has to continue to guide your heart because heart can change directions. That's uh, right. And a heartbeat. But, that's <laughs> yeah. right. But, but, but you can't have one without the other and be a great leader in my view. You can't be this intellectual giant that wears his intellect on his sleeve but has no heart. You can't lead people. Okay. People won't follow you. Uh, one of the sayings my dad t told me a long time ago, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Absolutely. When I was a young kid coming up in the restaurant industry and, and frankly coming up in my own parents' restaurant and I was asked to manage people who were much older than me, what they knew, what they always told my dad about me was this kid really cares about what he's doing. He cares about doing it right. And that fundamental thing that I learned when I was 18 years old basically has traveled with me, you know, through my entire life at this point. And, and you know, uh, I heard this the first time when I started teaching at university after my doctoral program. And my old, much older department had said, especially for undergrads, she said, you know what, exactly what your father said, that, you know, people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. And, uh, you know, not very many people would say that at the university level, but I guess that is true across the board, you know. It, it is. I, I think it's a fundamental belief in, in America. And by the way, it's, it's, it's missing in many of our leaders today. So that is true. So uh, what about executive coaching? Is that something you, you're just basically talking about coaching? You are coaching your executive team constantly. Uh, from a development perspective, uh, there's, a, there's a huge trend. And you're talking about leadership. So I'm talking about, you know, how do you manage your pipeline? There's, you know, one thing is to bring the right people. That's the best thing. Yep. But you still need to develop your leaders. Yeah. So do you encourage that development internally? Do you see that like uh, Schmidt from Google that, you know, it's great to have outsiders. And I saw that you were connected with Vistage for some reason. I don't know why, but so I thought I'll ask you these questions. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and you know, look, first of all, my fundamental belief is you earn the right to be developed. So your personal behaviors and performance on the job uh, gets you the gateway to further development. So first of all, it's not an entitlement. Okay. And I think that's a really important point. Certainly in my culture and all the companies I've ever run, there's, there are no entitlements. It's an earned environment. So first of all, earn the right. Our first step is typically within our own organization, we set up opportunities for people to get exposure to, you know, a young manager to get the exposure to a variety of departments so that when they become a general manager, they sort of know how all the intricacies work of the enterprise. So we prepare them by forward-looking ahead of where they are today. We have them forward-look into the next job. So it's sort of a job shadowing, a job, uh, a job sharing, if you will. Uh, and that also, by the way, develops the mentor relationship. Right. Which I think, I think people are missing mentors. I think today, if we could just get more people to mentor other people uh, in business, we'd be so far ahead. But again, if you're a mentor, that requires you to think of somebody else ahead of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It's, yes. a great, it's a great tool. It's, it's, you know, fundamentally, it's what an apprentice was 100 years ago. Correct, correct. Absolutely correct. There's that, and that's a very valid principle, by the way, in my view. Uh, so mentoring is really important. So that first step is internally you get exposed to what your next job may look like. And I think that's a really important point. You see how the culture works in your next role and what that would be and, and so forth. Um, then externally, you know, once a year or so, we bring in some folks to talk to our high-performing folks. Uh, to, to talk about all kinds of things. Now, I spend a lot of time with them on leadership because, as you know, I go around the country talking to a lot of groups about leadership. Right, right. So I, I find that I, my impact on them around, around the concepts of, the, of, of leadership and of my 12 commandments uh, goes a long way. Uh, we've gotten tremendously positive feedback on that. Um, but we will bring in external experts in to talk to them about a variety of things like human resources and all kinds of other issues in, you know, in business today. Uh, then that's sort of second level. And then, then, then third level is we will send people out. Uh, we haven't done it much, but we will send people out to very specific uh, skill development, right. uh, 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 you know, resources and seminars and such for them to develop a specific skill that they may be lacking. So to me, it's sort of a three-step uh, approach. Right. You know, like you said, uh, multitasking, I mean, the whole bunch of things need to be done. Uh, some more than, uh, more than the others, but uh, so many different ways to address the problem. You've got to keep your eye on a lot of moving parts and oh, yeah. machinery. Yeah, so I commend you for doing that so well, and I, I really appreciate the time that I had with you today and hope to remain connected with you. 
I agree, Nick. I could certainly feel very connected. To, uh, this was a great interview. I do a lot of them, but this was a really good chemistry, and uh, I feel really good about our dialogue today. So if you, if you ever want to talk again, I'd love to do it. Uh, and, and maybe you and I can get together and have dinner someday or whatever. You never know. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. We'd love to do that. So thank you so much. Indeed. My pleasure. Take care.